from former military powerhouses to incredible feats of engineering left behind. Here are eight of the most incredible abandoned ships ever. Number eight, the Peter Iredale. Visitors to the northern part of Oregon's Pacific coast have been able to witness an aging shipwreck rot for over a hundred years. The Peter Iredale, a 275-foot steel-hulled sailing ship, was making its way towards the coast in the early hours of October 1906 when the captain, H. Lawrence, spotted the Tillamook Rock Lighthouse. Using it as a guide, the captain tried to maneuver the ship through the dangerous mouth of the Columbia River, which had been known as a very treacherous area to sailors, even garnering the nickname of the Graveyard of the Pacific. As the captain approached in search of a pilot schooner that would help him navigate, Lawrence found no such guide, as in fact, the schooner was in the port undergoing repairs instead. As the wind rose and the tide advanced, Lawrence battled the elements, but a gale set the ship crashing into the jetty, immediately snapping three of the ship's four masts from the impact. Although no one on board was injured, the ship took damage to its hull. Initially thought to be just minor damage, the plan was to tow the Peter Iredale back out to sea. But over the next few weeks, as the crew waited for the weather to get better, the ship started to lean to its side, becoming embedded in the sand, making it nearly impossible to move. As the ship sat there, stuck and unable to be rescued, it was sadly sold for scrap. Anything not removed was simply left to rot and rust away, where it still stands to this day. Now a popular attraction for visitors who want to catch a glimpse of the rusted steel hull before it disintegrates for good. Number seven, the Sugar Ship. More than 40 years after a vicious storm overtook a Greek cargo vessel, the ship remains left to rust on Scotland's west coast. In January 1974, the MV Captianus was moored on the River Clyde with the hull filled with raw East African sugar. Waiting to unload its cargo, the ship was lashed by 60 miles per hour winds, dragging the ship's anchor across the river bottom and causing it to drift. As the captain ordered his crew to start the engines in effort to head for the shelter of nearby Gare Lock, the ship drifted into the anchor chains of a nearby tanker. The impact tore a hole in the hull of the Capteanus, flooding the hull and forcing the captain to try to save the ship and his crew by heading for a local sandbar. Luckily, he saved his entire crew, but the ship ran aground. Through the night, a small flotilla of tugboats tried to help the ship by preventing it from drifting further. Unfortunately, the ship began to lean to one side. The crew were able to jump onto rescue boats, but by the following morning, the ship had keeled over and it never sailed again. Because the ship is so close to a local bird sanctuary, it has been left intact, and now the birds have made it their home, along with fish, who have also made it a place to colonize in its empty hatches. Although it has been stripped for parts, much of the ship's skeleton remains, and it lingers there in the lock, the sugar boat that remains a part of the Clyde landscape. Some would say that it's eerily beautiful. Number six, SS Kakapo. South Africa's Long Beach is a stunning white sand paradise. It is also the home to the skeleton of a ship that wrecked there in 1900. One of the many ships that fell victim to South Africa's rocky shoreline, the SS Kakapo, was a 665-ton schooner rigged steamship that fell victim to the characteristic fog, strong currents, and inhospitable cliffs that have taken 360 ships in the Table Bay area alone. On its way from the UK to Sydney with a cargo of coal, the SS Kakapo ran aground in the Cape of Storms, being whipped by a massive gale that impaired the visibility of the ship's crew. The ship ended up on the beach after mistaking Chapman's Peak for Cape Point. Although none of the crew were injured, the ship became trapped in the sandy shore. Legend has it that after the mishap, the captain was so mortified by his mistake that he refused to leave the ship and lived there for as long as three years. Built in 1898 and named after a type of parrot from New Zealand, the SS Kakapo remains where it came to rest. 120 years later, the sand, wind, and waves have worn away much of its exterior, with only the hull and boiler still visible. Have you ever seen a shipwreck up close in real life? Where was it? What was it? Tell me about your experience in the comments below. Then remember to subscribe to American Eye if you haven't already for more intense videos just like this one. Number five, Edward Bolin. The SS Kakapo isn't the only ship to fall victim to the conditions of South Africa's coast. The beauty of the white sand beaches can't be denied, but neither can the sometimes dangerous conditions of the surrounding waters where many ships remain after wrecking. 
tourists can even travel what is known as the Shipwreck Trail to view the Cape of the Storms, where multiple rusted and rotting holes remain. One of the most well-known wrecks is that of the Edward Bolin. The reason it gets so much attention over the other wrecks is its location. It appears stranded in the middle of the desert. A German cargo ship that ran aground went on its way to Table Bay. The ship now lies about a quarter mile from the shoreline. Overtaken by sand, the ship ran into trouble in 1909 due to the thick fog that resulted in the ship losing its way and running around at Conception Bay. Now partially buried, it has become one of the most photographed wrecks for the stark contrast in its rusted hull and its location offshore instead of submerged in the water like most wrecks. The Skeleton Coast certainly lives up to its name, with so many storied shipwrecks lost to the conditions and now left as a reminder of the danger of the world's oceans. Let's just say I wouldn't go for a boating trip there if I weren't with a really experienced sailor or two. Number 4. HMVS Cerberus A breakwater ship that served as part of the Victorian Naval Forces in Australia, the HMVS Cerberus rests off the coast as a rusting scrap almost 90 years after it was last set sail. With its central armored structure that contained elevated gun turrets and a bridge, the ship was built to withstand breaking waves. It was built with a heavy iron structure and a lighter hull that were very different from the wooden warships of the past. It was designed without masts to be powered purely by steam, and it has guns that can fire around every one and a half minutes. Despite its weaponry and its status as one of the jewels in the Royal Australian Navy fleet, the 220-foot-long warship never left its home port and it never saw action. It did, however, patrol the coast, protecting Melbourne and its rich gold resources from attack. But even though it was an ingenious design that inspired the designs of future surface, gun-armed ships until guided missiles were brought in during the late 1960s, the Cerberus was soon superseded by more advanced technology and construction. By World War I, the ship's status as a warship was revoked making it a guard ship where munitions were stored, often supplying submarines. But in 1924, the ship was retired and sold for scrap. Of course, this meant its hull was stripped down and resold. Then it was scuttled in Half Moon Bay to serve as a breakwater to protect the coast from devastating waves. Even after being stripped down to nothing, it's still serving its purpose by protecting the coast where it once sailed. There's something poetic, if a bit sad, about that ending to this ship's story, don't you think? Number 3. SS Mahino In 1905, the SS Mahino was built in Scotland as part of the fleet for the New Zealand Union Steamship Company. The first turbine steamer to cross the Pacific Ocean, the 5,000-ton ship transported passengers between Auckland and Sydney until it was commissioned during World War I into a hospital ship. It served in that capacity until after the war when it resumed commercial services. In fact, it was actually bought by a Japanese company. As the ship left Sydney in the summer of 1935, bound for Osaka, it ran into a severe cyclone. The tow line from the ferry that had been transporting the ship was severed and without her rudders, which had been removed for towing. The Mahino drifted, washing ashore on Fraser Island's 75-mile beach. In an attempt to save the ship, she was stripped of her bearings, but any attempts to refloat the ships to resume her journey failed. Realizing she was a lost cause, the owner put the ship up for sale but with no takers. She was left where she sat, abandoned. Between 1856 and 1935, some 23 wrecks have occurred in that area. The SS Mahino, one of the first turbine-driven steamers, is one of the many that have become a landmark attraction around Australia's Fraser Island. Number two, the YOGN-82. As ships age and decay, governments are finding ways to make these relics of the past useful. In the Fraser Valley, located in Canada, one of the last concrete ships took on a new life when it was slated to become an artificial reef of the Sunshine Coast. Built during the Second World War, the YOGN-82 ship was made with reinforced concrete, along with nine other American wartime vessels purchased by the Catalyst Paper Mill in the 1960s. They were initially used as a breakwater to protect the mill's log pond. Part of the Powell River seascape for years, the barges were built with concrete because at the time, there were steel shortages which led to the U.S. military ordering a small fleet of ocean-going concrete ships and barges. Constructed in California in 1944, the YOGN-82, which stands for Yard Oiler Gasoline, had no engines. One of 10 ships purchased by the company, the ships remained useful for years, but as mill production decreased, the need for so many ships dropped off too. 
When the company started working with the local artificial reef society in British Columbia, they came up with the idea to make the ships more environmentally friendly after their inevitable retirement. The plan took shape and the fate of the ships as an artificial reef was sealed. After finding the perfect spot on the seafloor that could accommodate the massive wreck, the YOGN-82, along with three other ships, were prepared, making sure there was no asbestos, lead, or other pollutants left behind before they were loaded with explosives and sunk. Luckily, concrete is one of the best materials for artificial reefs, with animals and other sea life making it their habitat quickly. In the case of YOGN-82, it took about 11 minutes for the ship to sink, and it remained upright all the way to the sea floor. Only half an hour after its sinking, sea urchins had already attached themselves to her deck, and scuba divers can now visit the site to see how the vessel has taken on a new role as something beneficial to the local sea life. Now this is a shipwreck I'd love to check out for myself. How about you? And number one, the Fathom 5 Marine Park. East of the Bruce Peninsula in the Canadian province of Ontario, the Fathom 5 National Marine Park is home to 20 islands, tons of fish, and more than 20 shipwrecks that are visible from the surface. Known as the shipwreck capital of Canada, the area has some ships that date as far back as the mid-1800s, with some available for snorkeling, diving, and via glass-bottom boat tours. The park gets its name from Shakespeare's famous play, The Tempest, and it is home to Big Tub Lighthouse, built in 1885 and which played an important role guiding ships through the waters of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. Evidence of the dangers of sailing on the Great Lakes, the shipwrecks lie in narrow channels in shallows that made it a treacherous journey for traders. At the time, schooners with massive masts were bringing supplies to developing lumber towns along the shorelines. Each of the wrecks is a haunting reminder of the recent past, including the 160-foot-long schooner, the Charles P. Minch, which ran aground in 1898 and whose massive rudder is still visible today. An even larger wreck, the W.L. Westmore, is only 32 feet deep, making it popular with divers who want to get up close and personal to get a look at the remaining chains and deck fittings. Submerged near the park's islands, which were formed about 400 million years ago, the wrecks offer a glimpse into the past. Surrounded by imposing cliffs, known as flower pots, these schooners, barges, and steamers are some of the oldest and most well-preserved wrecks in Canada. Thanks for watching. Which of these impressive abandoned ships got your imagination working? Which one would you want to visit in person? Tell me if you know of any shipwrecks that should be included in future videos. Then subscribe so you can watch them soon. See you next time, right here on American Eye.